Okay, so um, hello, uh, my name is Michael Love, and I am a member of the uh, Opal uh, Math Fellowship. Uh, we started up in uh, February of 2020, so right before all the isolation and lockdown started. Um, my uh, fellow participants in the math group are uh, Ann Abbott, uh, who teaches math and statistics at University of Idaho. Uh, Paul Blue is at College of Western Idaho, and Jessica G is at uh, Idaho State University. Um, so the plan today is I'm going to introduce um, you know what our plan was uh, in navigating the Opal Fellowship, what we intended to do, uh, and then Jessica and Ann have some experiment and project examples uh, of you know some of the content we've come up with. And Paul is going to give you a quick run through of some of the processes that we've gone through uh, throughout the development of our project. So our uh, this fellowship, like I, I mentioned, started in uh, February 2020. We got the invitation. Um, and if you're not too terribly familiar with it, the fellowship was intended to just, you know, promote uh, advocate, advocacy for open resources. And our goal was to try and create open resources to be shared throughout the state of Idaho. Um, our specific group wanted to focus on a resource that was compatible or comparable rather uh, to the pre-calculus level, but for non-STEM students. Uh, a lot of the non-STEM math seems to stop right around or maybe just a little bit short of the advanced algebra level. Uh, when we looked, we saw that just about all of the content, even for non-STEM students, seems to start at the abstract level where they build equations and then try to find ways to apply them to real world situations. And we decided to try and take that and flip it around, you know, start with the more concrete um, ideas, conceptual projects and activities where students can get their hands dirty with math and then build the abstract formulas and behaviors from that. And throughout our process, we've been sharing the ideas, sharing our uh, pedagogical strategies and you know, sharing data that we've uh, gotten from piloting some of the projects. And um, with that in mind, I'd like to turn it over to Anne so she can present her project. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I started making some slides for this and decided not to finish them because my whole process with the activity that I'm about to describe is really a thought process. So I didn't want to put anything uh, other than thinking into anyone's mind with it. So this activity that I started developing, uh, my original thinking is for a college algebra level. And it's specifically around the, the time in college algebra where we talk about functions. Uh, this is a really good time for many students to jump into the, the kind of cultural thing right now that, you know, another day has gone by and I didn't use algebra. Uh, and I, I want to change that thinking for them as much as I can. So this activity goes something like this. I call it using math to follow your dreams. And I like to use this right at the section after we introduce basic functions into college algebra, but before we start transforming those functions into, uh, from a mathematician's point of view, into a way that we can use those functions from a modeler's point of view to make the modeling more realistic. So with this activity, I ask my students to arrive at some big purchase that they wanna make. The only restriction on the purchase is that it needs to cost a lot more money than what they have available at any given time, particularly right now. So I ask them to think about that big purchase 
and to write it down. Then I ask them all to think about and list at least three reasons that they don't have that amount of money right now. As soon as they've got that done, I bring everyone back and we have a class discussion about these reasons that they don't have the, the necessary amount of money. Then I translate those into the inputs into a functional relationship. So where the goal of our function, the output would be the necessary amount of money for the purchase. And these reasons become the factors and the inputs to the function. As we talk about the differences, uh, the differences and the commonalities in these factors that the students realize, it uh, intentionally brings accessibility into the course. It makes it real for all of the students. What will come out of this, they will have reasons that affect the reasons. So factors that will affect the factors. What will almost immediately show up for the students is how complex this functional system is. Then I ask them to choose probably in their mind or what is in their mind, the most important factor that's affecting their amount of money. Bring them back to the basic functions that we've just covered in the previous week in the course and ask them to imagine the functional shape and the functional relationship between this limiting factor, the constraint to their amount of money and realizing the amount of money. At that point, I can bring the functional discussion into an overarching modeling scenario and a modeling context. I like to use George Box's phrase, all models are wrong, but some are useful and that we always want to start with the simplest possible model, test it out, see if that works, and then build the complexity to it. And at that point, then I can move them back into the abstract form of transformations of functions in the class. Uh, when I have done this in the classroom, the students love it. Um, it they start to realize that math has a bigger reason. Uh, and what I hope to show them through this activity is the math inside of the reality. But I start from the reality first and we bring it back into the skeletal function of the math. Uh, I've got adaptations of this for various levels of mathematics courses and also into statistics courses at several different ways. And it, so it's, it's very fun and I'm excited about sharing it with everyone. And at this point, I'm gonna shift over to Jessica now so that she can give you a, an idea of what she's been working on. Jessica, you're muted. Okay, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Are you able to see that? Hello? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. All right. Okay. All right. So I will talk about a project I implemented in teaching calculus two. Uh, so this project real model is just like in addition to the regular assignments, the exam, homework, final exam. I just assign a project to when, when, when I'm teaching the calculus too. So the project assessment is very adaptable to the distance, uh, to the kind of like the remote learning and teaching experience, uh, learning and teaching experience. It is right now what we have. And we have the time and feedback for students and it has minimum programming requirement. Uh, Cause as we know, in calculus and also in college algebra, not all students have the ability to program. But uh, for this project, I made it in a way such that as long as you can do the spreadsheet, then you are okay to deal with that. Okay. 
and it is adaptable to other classes such as calculus one and college algebra because we have different levels and uh, different choices for student. The description is the project is about how to simulate the spread of the common code. So basically that is a very simplified model of what's happening for the COVID. It has seven parts and in each part, for each part, uh, students have two weeks to finish it. So that's kind of like 17 weeks long project and it is implemented for the whole semester. So basically for example, in the first two weeks, students will form a group and do the simulation remotely. They can join the Zoom meeting and use this map to simulate the spread of the virus. And then they collect the data. They're gonna enter the data to the Google, Google spreadsheet and share it with, within the group. So they do not need to meet face-to-face -to, -face to do the project. Everything is adaptable for the remote, for, the, for all the remote meetings. And then they do the model development, basically set up a different gradient. Um, I will give them several options for them to choose from. So even though they, they do not have the background of what does mean by different gradient, they can still make some good choice. And uh, more importantly, they will be able to interpret or explain why they're gonna pick up this different gradient. And then what's next is gonna set up technical issues. They will use spreadsheet to do the scatter plot and the linear regression for, to estimate the initial, initial value of the parameter. And then they're gonna solve the differential equation. That is a very simple differential equation because in calculus two, in chapter nine, they will be able to learn method to solve it. And then for the optimization part, uh, this is kind of a bit challenging, but I made it into three levels. So depending on the ability of students, they can choose each level to do something at least to make the parameter better. And uh, this project gonna be finalized with a report and a presentation, okay? So basically uh, each group will meet together and uh, do a Zoom record of the presentation and they, then they upload their Zoom record to me for me to grade it. So basically I will give those kind of things for the students to help them think out the project. In addition to the project statement and rubrics, I will give them a pre-filled Google sheet for the, for the spreadsheet. And for each part, because we have seven parts, for each part, I will give them a report template. So basically in a report template, uh, paragraph one is the objective for, for this part. And the paragraph two gonna be the contributions of each group member to this part. And then next, then what follows gonna be the actions you need to do basically things to do for this part. So um, I know that basically to, because uh, the levels of, of students are different. So basically if you, like sometimes last, I uh, think when I taught different creative courses, uh, I didn't give them any template. So that's why I have a diversity of report from, from students. Some students are really strong in programming and they made a, we just did a very good work, uh, perfect work in programming, but they are kind of weak in something like simulation or solving different equations and vice versa. So in order to keep all the students to contribute or understand the project, I give them a template. So basically as long as they follow the things to do in the template and I fill out the blank the template, then I will make sure that each group can at least get something from the project. So basically the, the ob objective is we start with some driving questions, like is how the, how the code or the virus spreading out. And then students gonna, I will give them choices so they can choose the model scenario that they think gonna match with what's happening for the spread of disease. And then I will give them feedback. So there are some revisions and reflections. And then they will think further in this direction. Basically, for example, if you change something, if you change the situation, like if we clean the public places, will such kind of actions slow down the spread of disease, spread of virus? So they will ask those questions, vary some parameters and see what will happen. And then interpret what's happening in the biological and, uh, and uh, the real world background. So all of them, they are, they are doing all of them, the main purpose, the main 
objective is to equip the student with some workforce skills such as teamwork, project, uh, project management, report writing, and the presentation and so on. So we have some performance and feedback from students. So basically they are doing so far so good. That's level zero, one, zero, one, and a two. The difficulty levels are zero, one, and two. So basically most students, they all feel okay with working with the project. So they have some difficulty, like there are four students, they have some difficulty in doing the uh, scatter plot and so on, but uh, they will, those pro these problems can be overcome easily. So see the levels of meeting remotely and that, that's a difficulty of project submission. That's a difficulty of report writing. The levels are basically, level of difficulty basically zero, one, and two. That's pretty fun. And uh, the student told me that the, they like the project template. <laughs> the project template helps them a lot. And I have some feedback from the students when we're teaching uh, calculus and differential equations. Basically, they like the modeling part. They like the project part. And um, because by doing the project, they kind of know how to apply what they learn in mathematics to a real world problem. And they generally they like the way of project-driven teaching mode because they are just a, uh, because the project kind of a balance of all the costworks like exam and homework. Uh, as we know that it's kind of hard to do the assessment in, the, in this situation due to the pandemic. Um, like our exam and take home exam, they are open book, open notes. So in order to balance the kind of like the assessment of the traditional, um, traditional assignments, so I just give them project. So basically overall they like the way of teaching. So that's kind of my experience. Thank you. So I will turn over to Paul for summarize and the questions. Yeah, so I was asked to just talk about a little bit more of the history of the process uh, we went through to, to get to the point where we are now. You know, when we first got together, um, we did, we did uh, identify that we would like to think of a different way to help uh, non-STEM students appreciate and enjoy mathematics. And uh, our first approach was a traditional textbook. We actually uh, had a template of chapters and sections and we when we spent time even writing parts of that book and kind of following the traditional way. But then we realized, wait a minute, if we really want to reach these non-STEM students, you know, we need to give them these more concrete experiences uh, that kind of touch on their personal lives. And traditional textbooks don't do that. They don't have that. And so we realized it was last, last year in the fall that we needed to abandon the traditional textbook approach and think about activities like uh, Anne showed or projects like Jessica showed. That's what we need to write for our OER. We need to uh, outline projects and activities that really make uh, that start with the concrete and move to the abstract. And also we wanted to tap on intr their intrinsic motivation. You know, the research on intrinsic motivation says that the students need to have a purpose that's personally important to them. They need, it needs, they need to have things that are relevant. They need to have autonomy. Jessica talked about choices. Uh, and, and then there's the competence. And, and to tap into that, we need projects and activities like Jessica and Ann were doing. And so we, that's when we decided that our OER uh, uh, book is going to be a set of activities and projects that tap on tap into that intrinsic motivation and 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 move and have students start with the concrete uh, personal their personal life things that are important to me you know uh, and mentioned a dream the dream that they want or something and and so our, we are now going to have a, an OER um, resource of we're all going to do three projects in our group. It's going to be twelve projects or activities that are similar to uh, what Anne and uh, Jessica did. And so that's that's where we are now. That's that's where we're going to end uh, at the end of the semester. So I guess we'll leave it now to questions. See, Michael, were you going to moderate the questions or is, <laughs> did you want me to do that? Um, yeah, I, I can. And uh, Anne just pointed out to me that I have a typo in her email address. 
It should be U Idaho, not U I dot E D U. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I apologize for that. Um, so, yeah, let's. Michael, there is a question in the Q&A session. Oh, yeah, there is. Wouldn't yes. this approach also be useful for STEM majors? It, it very well could be. Um, one of the things that we talked about in our meetings is that one of the, uh, one of the general learning outcomes uh, for Idaho is in, in math classes, being able to communicate math ideas effectively. And, you know, we've also, we've all approached this with the idea of, you know, talking to other math students about the math ideas, but then someone, I don't remember who, um, suggested that, you know, well, what does it mean to communicate effectively? And that idea changes based on who's communicating and who they're communicating to. So, um, you know, the approach of concrete first and abstract second, um, I personally think could work great for STEM majors as well, because it can build that concrete or conceptual uh, re reference frame and then add the more theoretical or abstract to it where students can maybe spend time seeing how the parts interact rather than memorizing formulas. And also I want to make a comment. So for sure those projects um, are adaptable to STEM majors. For example, in my calculus two and different current courses, um, more than half of them are STEM majors. So in this case, you just, uh, like I, what I mentioned, there are several choices and several levels to kind of uh, make the level higher. So make it a bit challenging. So that is easy adapted for STEM students for sure, yes. Paul or Anne, do you have anything to add quickly before we get to Stephanie's question? I added mine, uh, it, just typing it. I, uh, Anne, I mean, Anne's project was done in a college algebra class. That is mainly STEM majors. So <laughs> she's al already using it kind of in a class that is usually mainly STEM majors, so. Okay, uh, so Stephanie asked that she loved hearing about the ideas. Is there a time uh, perhaps coming to commenting, if there's time perhaps commenting on what attracted you to OER and how library staff could get more faculty involved in projects like this? Um, and someone else asks, how did you find time to collaborate on projects like this over the last year, given additional responsibilities, crises, uncertainties, et cetera? Uh, so, Stephanie, the short answer on yours is I'm not entirely sure how library staff could get more involved with projects like this, um, short of, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of hitting a roadblock as to how to answer your question, so I might not be the, the right person to answer. So, if uh, Jessica, Ann, or maybe even Jonathan uh, would like to to pipe in uh, because we have had li uh, librarians uh, involved in other aspects of the OPAL project. And I'm not entirely sure how to answer your question. So Anne said she would like to uh, address the anonymous attendee about collaboration. Uh, so, so as far as finding the time, I look at it as uh, I always have time for things that are my priority. And in reality, this is how I teach anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the big thing with the uh, finding the time was just scheduling and, you know, as far as the development, you know, just making sure we carve out a little bit of time here and there, just an hour or two, a, you know, a, a week makes a, made a big difference in just getting some content put up. So thank you so much, um, presenters. It looks like we're at 1025 and we were going to do a five minute break. Um, if you'd like to stay and answer more questions, you can, but I want to invite everybody to take your five minute break and we will regroup at the hour for our next presentation. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to stick around for anyone that wants to ask questions um, for the next five, you know, few minutes.
Looks like you do have a question from Chadwick. Is there still the option for students to not have to purchase a textbook? One of the most appealing aspects of OER for students is a lightening of the financial burden. Yeah, so Chadwick, with uh, the project we're working on, it's intended to be open. Um, so once you know we get to the point that you know it's distributable, uh, it should be available uh, free for anyone that free or low cost to anyone that wants it. Yeah, and I, I think um, you know we're we're uh, we're. Um, uh, you know, we're working on some activities and projects, um, but I think you could easily then add um, to this the content because it's also it, it will be important in, a, in the math class that they do learn some of the, the learning outcomes of the academic skills of the, of the course, you know, knowing the math language. And so, but these activities uh, definitely could be combined then with OER uh, resources on the content. I mean, we can get an OER resource that talks about basic functions. We don't have to have a, a publisher textbook for that. We can get a OER resource for the, the you know, the, the, the mathy stuff that you usually traditionally learn. So yeah, they it could be combined to be a total OER. Uh, or this could just be combined with a, a publisher textbook uh, as a, for activities and um, projects that could be used. So that's what I would say about that. Good to see you, Chadwick. Um, Chadwick was one uh, uh, was an embedded tutor in one of my classes, so I just wanted to say hi to him. 